We're in chapters 3 and 4. We're going to be looking tonight in uh, Esther chapters 3 and 4. I chose to entitle this particular installment of our study, Esther's Venture of Faith. And you're going to be seeing that in just a moment. So beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 6, Esther chapter 3. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. And all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? Now it happened when they spoke to him daily, and he, and he would not listen to them, that they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage, Haman was filled with wrath. But he he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai instead. Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. Now, last time we were together, we closed with verses 21 through 23 of uh, chapter 2, where it says, In those days, while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Bigthan and Teresh, doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. And when an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed, and both were hanged on a gallows, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Now, that's important to see. We're going to be looking at something in just a moment. But as we had seen this, Esther's cousin Mordecai had heard of a plot to assassinate the king. And what he did, as we just read, is he, he, he had let Esther know, and she had warned her husband. The conspirators were caught, and they were hanged on the gallows. Again, I mentioned this to you. It was not necessarily being hanged by the neck. They were impaled. They were impaled on posts, on stakes. It was a terrible way to kill somebody. It was a horrible form of capital punishment. But it was a common way of execution. Um, The king, by the name of Darius, it's recorded in history, once impaled 3,000 men. And so it was a common way to... uh, to, to kill people, to execute them. And so that's what had happened. And so he's speaking of after these things and how that king Ahasuerus has promoted Haman. Now, after verse 2, after the thwarted assassination and the execution, Haman had been promoted. As a high-ranking official, special respect was to be afforded him. So all other nobles were to bow before him. But notice how we just read, Mordecai refused persistently. Why is that? Well, as a Jew, it was just something he would not do. To, to, to do homage to a man, especially to a pagan, was forbidden to a Jew. Now, this was in simple respect. In Persia, it was actually an act of worship. And this kind of devotion is reserved for God alone. And so Mordecai would not give him the worship, the homage that he desired. Well, as he was not doing that, as we see in verse 3... The king's servants who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? Now it happened when they spoke to him daily, and he would not listen to them, well, that they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For Mordecai had told them he was a Jew. So they're watching this. They see it daily. People will watch you. They will notice you. They've noticed what's going on with him. And they, they saw that he refused to bow down, and he refused to bow down every time uh, Haman would walk by. He did it daily. It was consistent. And so they wanted to know uh, why he wasn't doing it, and, and he continued to refuse to do it. And so after he persistently refuses, as we just read, they spoke to Haman about it. So in verse 4, they reported this to Haman. They wanted to see if, if he would continue to refuse to do homage. Now, Mordecai had revealed that he was a Jew. How will Haman handle this problem? You see, they had to do homage. And why would Mordecai have the right to refuse? 
Here's your question. Do his religious convictions trump the customs of the land? Well, when Haman saw that Mordecai wouldn't bow or pay him homage, he became filled with wrath, which is very typical of petty government officials. When you don't do what they say, they get angry. When you don't do what they have told you to do, they take it very personally, very often. Not all, but many do. Jesus spoke to us concerning power in the New Testament, and he spoke to us concerning how those who are ungodly, how they wield it. Remember in Matthew's gospel, in chapter 20, verses 25 through 27, how Matthew writes that Jesus called them together, and he said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. So the Christian way is an upside-down pyramid, if you will. In today's pyramid of you know, structures of authority, the top of the pyramid is going to be the chief. It's going to be the CEO or whatever he may be called. And then everybody else is, is underneath him. In Jesus' upside-down kingdom, the greatest in the kingdom is the servant of all. And so the way that the pagan world looked at leadership was tyrannically. And so he's upset, as we just read, because Mordecai will not pay him homage. Notice again in verse 5, and when he wouldn't, Haman was filled with wrath. But, verse 6, he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. So instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. It wasn't enough to want to get even with this upstart, this man who would not show him homage. He was going to kill not only him, but his, his household too. He was upset. He disdained, notice verse 6, he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. He felt himself so important and the insult so great that it deserves great punishment. So my solution, he's saying, is to wipe out all the Jews. And I'm going to do it not just here where we're at. We're going to reach to wherever Ahasuerus rules, which would include Israel. So we're going to wipe out every one of the Jews, annihilate, destroy, and kill. We're going to do that. Now, if he would have succeeded with his plan, he would have annihilated all of the Jews. That's not a new thought, by the way. We're seeing that now, obviously. That is what's taking place even as I'm speaking to you. And you know this, Hamas is making comments that they want to obliterate Israel. They want to wipe it off the map. They want to go from the east and just push them out and kill them all. I, I've been hearing these things. So this is not a new thing. This is something that's ancient. The hatred for the Jewish nation is not a new thing. It is something that has been going on for many, many years. And you see it here. So the psalmist in Psalm 83, verses 2 through 4, said it like this. See how your enemies are astir, how your foes rear their heads. With cunning, they conspire against your people. They plot against those you cherish. Come, they say, let us destroy them as a nation, that the name of Israel be remembered no more. Your Bible is coming alive right now before your face. It's coming alive. It's coming. It's just, it's just, this is not new. The desire and their plot to destroy Israel will never succeed. Proverbs 16, verse 5 says it like this. Everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though they join forces, none will go unpunished. And so they're not going to succeed. They're not going to succeed now. And they didn't succeed back then. And so his desire is to wipe them all out. He wants to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. Verse 7, in the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast Pur, that is the lot, before Haman to determine the day and the month until it fell on the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. And so the first month, would be March or April. The year is around 474. 
Now, it would have been around four years since Esther had become queen. So to determine when they're going to annihilate the Jews, they cast the lot. They call it Pur. So the Jews actually had almost a full year to prepare themselves for what was going to take place. Now, by this, Haman is revealing his superstitious inclinations. He's trusting fate and he's trusting chance. He's searching for a lucky day that would make his plans succeed. Haman didn't know that the God of Israel would determine how he was to preserve his people. It says in Proverbs 16, 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. And so they think that they're going to have a lucky day. For them, a lucky day is to begin the annihilation of every person of the nation of Israel. Well, in verse 8, Haman said to King Ahasuerus, there's a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from all other peoples, and they do not keep the king's laws. Therefore, it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. If it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they may be destroyed. And I'll pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring it into the king's treasury. Now notice he says in verse 8, these people have different laws. They refuse to keep yours. They refuse to keep his laws because they have a higher law. That, that's, again, something that, uh, that plays into us as Christians. We are to be the, the, the ones who are most um, law-keeping, I'd say. I, I believe every, every Christian should be a, a, a person who is, uh, is, is uh, keeping the law. Obviously, that, you know, we're, we do that because uh, government has been established by the Lord. But when the law violates the commands of God, that's when we make a, a stand. That's when we stand in opposition. That's how it works. And so they were refusing to keep the law because their, their law that they listened to, that they obeyed, was higher. Their refusal to keep his laws came from a, uh, a love for and a courage that came because they kept a higher law. And they're not going to give man the honor that is reserved for God alone. And so moral courage results from following a higher authority. Where does your courage come from? It comes from a higher authority. Remember, we've been going through the book of Acts on Sunday. And in Acts 5.29, it reads that Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. We have a higher standard that we're to hold fast to. In Psalm 27, verse 1, it says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Jesus said, if you're going to fear, don't fear man. He said, fear God who's able to kill and cast you into hell. If you want to fear, he said, fear him. And so whom shall I fear? I, I am to fear no, no one except the Lord. Well, notice how he says in verse 9, if it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed. What is he saying? He's saying this. This is terrible. I will pay to have them die. Now, let me show you something here. Verse 9. He says, I'll pay 10,000 talents of silver. Talents of silver. Okay, what is that, right? What is a talent? What this is speaking of is 750,000 pounds of silver. 750,000 750, pounds of silver. I, I looked that up. I wanted to say, okay, how much would that be worth right now? Because I just happened to have that in my, in my wallet. <laughs> uh, as of yesterday, that would have been around $240 million. Now, he may be extremely rich, more than likely is, but he also may have wanted to draw money from the spoils because when all the people are killed... The spoil is left behind, and he can make claim to that. So he would have put the money into the king, king's treasuries, and in doing so, he would have repaid himself, and that's his plot. Well, when he says it, verse 10, the king took his signet ring from his hand, gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, Hamadatha the Agite, Agagite, what a name, <laughs> Agaga, the guy from Ontario, the enemy of the Jews. <laughs> And, and the king said to Haman, the money 
And the people are given to you to do with them as seems good to you. The ring that he's speaking about is a symbol. By giving him the ring, that's a symbol of the king's authority. Haman now is wielding the king's authority. And as you see this in verses 10 and 11, the king grants permission. And he's also going to sponsor this. Once again, typical of a petty monarch, when, when Haman said, your laws are being disregarded, Ahasuerus responded because his honor had been impugned. Verse 12, then the king's scribes were called on the 13th day of the first month, and a decree was written according to all that Haman commanded to the king's satraps, to the governors who were over each province, to the officials of all the people, to every province according to its script, and to every people in their language. In the name of King Ahasuerus, it was written and sealed with the king's signet ring. And the letters were sent by couriers into all the king's provinces, to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their, position, their uh, possessions. A copy of the document was to be issued as law in every province, being published for all people, that they should be ready for that day. The couriers went out, hastened by the king's command, and the decree was proclaimed in Shushan, the citadel, citadel. So the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Shushan was per perplexed. Again, we're reading the newspaper to destroy, to kill, to annihilate both young and old, little children and women. Um, I'll say this briefly. It's not part of my study. It just comes to mind. I think it's important that we as Christians remember our biblical history and, and reading portions of Scripture like this help us to understand what's going on today. Uh, there is very definitely a, a great brainwashing taking place, I think, in colleges and high school campuses. There's a tremendous brainwashing. Um, the, the things that we saw on the news, and they're, they're, they're censoring the uh, pictures because they're just too bad. And I don't even really want to go into the things. Perhaps some of you haven't been following what took place on that day when, uh, when uh, Israel was attacked in the way it was. But it is beyond description. The horror of it is something beyond a human being's imagination, what has taken place. And I can't say it. I'm, I'm thinking of things. Can I say this? No, I can't say this. I will say this. And this is, this is horrible by itself. When it says here uh, to annihilate both young, old, little children and women, that's what went on. That's what went on. Little children, over 40 of them, were beheaded. Children were burned to death while alive. Uh, women were raped so severely that it broke their pelvis. There are things you're not hearing, perhaps, or things you're not watching. Or, and I can understand if you don't want to know. I do understand that. But that's what's taking place. And so what we have people now are people who are marching and saying, you know, uh, ceasefire, etc. I, I, I don't, I don't see that uh, Israel's going to do a ceasefire. I don't. Um, because this was the greatest slaughter of Jews since the Holocaust. And so that's, that's not going to happen. And so when people say, oh, no, there is no anti-Semitism, the fact is it's, it's increasing. It's voluminously increasing even is, as I'm speaking. There are quite a number of people who, uh, who are turning their hearts against the, the Jewish people, and uh, it, it's just a horrible thing. And it's, it's, it's almost surprising to see how it's taking place, but it is. It's happening in our day. And so the king um, um, orders a, a total annihilation, and it, this is leaving the city in confusion. The, some are, are rejoicing, but others are thinking, are we next? The Jews were living in Shushan. And they would have been terrified when this order goes out because they are going to be killed. And so the whole city is in confusion. So chapter 4, verse 1, when Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went as far as the front of the king's gate, for, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was a great mourning among the Jews, fasting, weeping, wailing, 
Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So they're all under the death penalty. And they're under the rule of a pagan government. What are they able to do? They're powerless. They can't save themselves. So Mordecai and the Jews begin to mourn. They begin to fast. They begin to weep. And they're wailing, wearing sackcloth and ashes, which are symbols of grief and mourning. It's how they show fear and pain. In the Old Testament book of Joel, chapter 1, verse 13, it says, Put on sackcloth, O priests, and mourn. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come, spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God. For the grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. So it was a common way to show fear and pain. Now, it took him, according to verse 1, courage to do this openly. He's there in the midst of the city. Now, a Jewish commentary that I, I read an excerpt from said that he read Scripture. In Deuteronomy 4, verses 30 and 31, when you are in distress and all these things have come upon you, in the latter days you will return to the Lord your God and listen to his voice. For the Lord your God is a compassionate God. He will not fail you, nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant with your fathers, which he swore to them. And so they're coming before the Lord, and they're asking God to, to save them. And as this is taking place, verse 4, Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. And then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away from him, but he would not accept them. Esther had not been aware, it would seem, of the news of impending annihilation. She was told Mordecai is crying. He's wearing sackcloth. It would seem that the maidservants had been made aware that she's Jewish. And so when she heard this, she wanted to clothe him. It may be she was a bit embarrassed on his behalf. So she wants to clothe him. But he refuses to accept those clothing, that clothing. Now, she doesn't associate his behavior. And this is interesting with spiritual mourning. It seems to indicate a bit at least, of ignorance on her part. It makes you wonder if she was taught any of the law of God. So as this is taking place, verse 5, Esther called, oh, here we go again, Jerry. <laughs> Athat, one of the king's eunuchs, whom he had appointed to attend her, and she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. Now, this man is a trusted servant, and he went to discover what was wrong. It would seem that at this point, her Jewishness is now being awakened. She can no longer afford to blend in. And as I was thinking about that, I, I wrote to myself in my notes, there comes a time when we must choose whom we shall serve. There comes a time when something happens, perhaps a crisis, some situation comes, and we need to know that we need to stand up and trust the Lord. I think a lot of people today have forgotten that God is a God of the miracles. He's a God who delivers. I think we forget these things sometimes. And so it, it appears, and some commentators think that Esther had buried her Jewishness for a while and may not be aware of what's taking place, but now this crisis has arisen, and she's going to have to respond. So verse 6, so Hathach went, went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication for him and plead before him for her people. And so Mordecai fills him in on what's taking place. He gives a copy of the decree for the destruction. And he says, you need to go and let her know immediately. And so he does. He returns and he tells Esther the words of Mordecai. Well, verse 10, Esther spoke to Athak and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. 
Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. I haven't been summoned. I cannot go into the king's presence without him making a request for me to be there. And if I go without his summons, I may be put to death. You don't seem to understand that this can cost me my life. Everyone in the kingdom knows that this is his one unwavering law. Now, putting this into some kind of context, remember Esther has been living in luxury for the last four years. She, she, has, she has things that, that we could only imagine. I mean, I, I don't understand. Here we go. I have to be careful how I say this because it sounds stupid even when I'm thinking it, but I'll say it anyway. I don't get it. I, I, don't, I don't understand. I thank God for my, for my personal upbringing. I thank God that I had a, a father who drove a truck who taught me to keep both feet planted on the earth. So I don't have a, an understanding of what it's like to live with such opulence that there's not a single thing anywhere that you can't buy. That's how she was. She ate banquets. She had banquets every day, basically, if she wanted. She wore the, the, the most beautiful gowns that could be made possible from the from the far corners of the kingdom. She, she lived in such luxury that she could have possibly gotten a bit soft. Now, Mordecai had said to her, do not disclose that you're Jewish. So she's been undercover for a long time. And being undercover and, and living in this way, in this fashion, to have people treating her in the way that they did. He had a lot of concubines. He had a lot of extra wives. But she was the queen. She was above all the rest. She was treated in an entirely different way. But notice, she hasn't been summoned for a month. So she's saying, I can't go to him. If I go in there, I could die. If I go before him without him summoning me, this may cost me my life. You don't know what you're asking of me. You don't know. But you have to, he's saying. You've been hiding that you're Jewish, but now you need to reveal it to the king. He's saying, don't be held captive to fear because fear is going to paralyze you. It's been said that courage is revealed when, though you're afraid, you still do what is needed. Courageous people and fear-filled people encounter the same obstacles. But how you respond to the hour and deal with your fears reveals who you are. It's been said heroes run towards danger while others run away from it. So you need to understand, Mordecai is saying, <laughs> you're already dead. You're Jewish. Don't think that you're going to be surviving. Don't think that. Verse 13, Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you'll escape the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. What makes you think that you will not become a victim to the order? Listen, Esther, you need to know something about the God that we serve. You need to understand that relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews. God is not going to allow his people to be completely annihilated. There is a way that deliverance will occur, and there is a deliverer. Have you not considered that your being in the palace was part of a plan by God all along? Remember when we were in chapter 2, how it had said in verse 8 that the young women gathered at Shushan, but she was taken? And I had mentioned to you that the word taken speaks about her being taken when the others voluntarily went. She went not wanting to. She didn't want to go there. She was taken. 
And so that was something she didn't plan for herself. And, and in uh, chapter 2, verse 15, remember how when they had the beauty contest, she didn't beautify herself before she went to see him. She didn't ask for anything extra, no special lip gloss or eyeliner. She just went in. She didn't try to win his affection. He gave it to her. So these things he's saying aren't simply a coincidence, and this isn't by chance. You need to know God is at work. So here's the thing. God will deliver his people. Why not through you? Have you ever asked the Lord that for yourself? When you look out and you see there's a need and you say to yourself, man, somebody ought to step up and do something about this. Have you ever thought that maybe you're the one who's supposed to stand up and step out? It's easy for, for me to say, uh, you know, Lord, you have a need. There he is. Send him. But it was Isaiah who said, here am I, Lord. Send me. Have you ever thought that perhaps there are things God wants you to step into that you're expecting somebody else to do because you see it's too hard or perhaps it's going to cost too much for you? that is going to require sacrifice. Everything worth having is worth sacrificing for. Anything worth having is worth sacrificing for. So he's telling her, listen, God is going to deliver us. He's not going to allow his children to be destroyed. He will not allow the annihilation of his people. So deliverance is going to arise. It will come. But Esther, why not through you? Why can't you be used? Why can't you start a Christian club in a school? Why can't you share the gospel with kids standing on a street corner? Why can't you lead worship? Why can't you do the things that, that you see and you wish that you could be part of or needs to be done? That's how, that's how I entered into ministry. It wasn't like, oh, I want some glory and glamour. It was that something needs to be done attitude and and God, here am I, send me. And that's how I entered into ministry. So you need to know who you are. God is going to deliver his people. Why not through you? And then he says, verse 14, who knows whether you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. You're not an accident in history, Esther. God has orchestrated these events. And I'm telling you, you have a purpose that God designed especially for you. How do you know that, that God didn't orchestrate all of this for this one moment for you to stand up and be used by God. And so this word that is sent is something that speaks to her heart. And so in verse 15, Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go, gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I'll blame you. No, if I perish, I perish. Notice how she says, fast for me. As I've shared with you, fasting represents mourning. It speaks of turning to God. So, I'm telling you to fast. Along with fasting, there's a is normally fasting and prayer. But as you're fasting, this is a way you turn to God. And, and verse 16, my maids and I will fast also, and then I'll go to the king. Now her maids were either Jewish or they had been converted. And then she says, and this I think is just an amazing thing: if I perish, I perish. If I perish, I perish. How hard was it for the king to get rid of Vashti, his other wife? It wasn't hard at all. She got a mad. And so let's just get rid of her. Let's have a beauty contest. And I'll get the foxiest lady in Persia, Esther. I don't need you. This isn't in my notes. Let me share something very briefly with you. One of the things about love in relationship 
is the one who loves least has the most power. And I think we all understand that. What do I mean by that? I mean that she could have loved him greatly, but she doesn't know that he loves her greatly. And when you're young, you learn this in your dating relationships. You know that if you care for somebody, and I'll speak from a male perspective and speak as of a young man dating a girl, you know that if you reveal your love for her, you know that if she doesn't have the same kind of love for you, that she will control you because that's what happened. If you love her more than she loves you, she will control you, and every man is aware of that. And it's true for women, too. If she loves the man more than he loves her, he will control her. So he'll say, I'll be over in an hour, and doesn't show up, and then she's mad and hurt, and he says, oh, I had other things to do. She says, oh, you're so lovely, I'll still forgive you because I love you. And he says, yeah, I knew you would. Why? Because she loves him more than he loves her. In the case with Esther, there has to be some sense of, I don't know how deep his affection really runs to me. Because Vashti was the most beautiful woman in the kingdom, and he got rid of her and got a new model. Why would I make myself think that I'm more important than she? What makes me think that he'll be more faithful to me than he was to her? And if I go to him and he doesn't uh, place his, uh, hold out his scepter to me, I'm as good as dead. And so she knows that. I haven't been summoned. I haven't seen him in a month. You're telling me to go. Don't you understand what's going to take place if I do? Don't you understand my, my head is going to be taken from my body? Don't you understand what can... He says, you know, God isn't going to let his people die. Deliverance is going to rise. Why can't it be you? Why can't you take a step of faith and see what God can do with you? Why don't you take a step of faith? And that's what she's doing. She says, if I perish, then I perish. I'm afraid. I know what could happen. I have no guarantee my effort will succeed. But I've made up my mind. I'm going to do that which is right. Even if it is costly, I'm going to yield my life. For my people, if that will result in their deliverance. If God protects her, she's going to be glad. But if he doesn't, she'll die knowing she did the right thing. And what she does is she resigns herself to the will of God. That God may deliver his people. It's interesting that. She was spared, and God delivered. But there was one who came later who did deliver his people, Jesus Christ, and he wasn't spared. He laid his life down. Esther was willing to, but Jesus did. I wonder if anybody listening to this right now, I wonder... If the Lord has laid something on your heart, something he wants you to do, something that you think somebody else can do, but the Lord has been laid it on your heart and has said, no, oh, I could use somebody else. But why not you? Why not you? You see, when I got saved, I didn't know anything about evangelism. What do you know when you're first saved about sharing your faith? You're just told, tell somebody that Jesus saved you. I mean, well, what does a brand new Christian really know? What do you really know? I was lost, now I'm found. That's basically it. I got saved. How'd you get saved? You know what? I can't even explain it. I gave my heart to Christ. That's what I did. But I was also told that Jesus died for the whole world. And all I did is I began to share with those who were in my personal world. And the most immediate would have been my family. It just made sense to me. You know, yeah, there were evangelists and there are great evangelists. Billy Graham was still busy and reaching lots of people. And there are others like him who were reaching people throughout the world. 
I, I could have said, well, maybe I can take my dad and mom someday to see one of these great evangelists, but I didn't do that. What I did was I thought, well, perhaps this is my opportunity. Maybe it's something I'm supposed to do. Maybe, well, as a matter of fact, it is, seeing that I know them best and I love them the most. Why would some stranger love my dad and mom more than I do? Why? So it just made sense to me. Tell them about Jesus. Because if I don't, who's going to? Can I expect Billy Graham to knock on the door and say, excuse me, Mr. Rosales, can I speak to you about Jesus? No, he's not going to do that. Can I expect some, some person on TV or a radio person to come to my house and do that? No, of course not. So I learned a long time ago that an evangelist already was in the house, and that was, that was me, a believer in Christ, who wanted my parents to know Jesus Christ. And my dad, I mean, my dad was, my dad was a, a man who, he was, you know, those who knew my dad, some in this church still remember him. They know him as a sweet and loving man, and he became that, but he wasn't always that. My dad told me, he said, when you told me I was going to go to hell, because that's what I told him. I said, Daddy, you're a good man. You'll be the best man in hell if you don't give your heart to Jesus Christ. He said, when you told me I was going to go to hell, he said, I wanted to get up and hit you. That was my dad. That was my dad. He said, but when you told me you loved me, he said, that made the difference. Because in my house, we never said, I love you. The only person who ever said that kind of thing was my mom. My dad, in my entire life, only told me I love you one time. In all my life, one time. He didn't have to. I knew he did. But he wasn't a man who could do that. So when I told him, Daddy, I love you, and I don't want to go to heaven without you, Bow your head. You're going to receive Christ right now. That's why he got saved. God had placed me in that family for that reason, for such a time as that. How about you? How about you? Why not you? Why somebody else? Why does somebody else have to do the work that God could use you to do? Why don't we step out in faith? Why don't we tell our friends, tell our neighbors, Tell whomever, in whatever way God gives us the ability to, God loves you. Jesus died for you, and I care about you. Why not? Somebody's got to do it. Instead of saying, there he is, Lord, use him, I just started saying, here am I, Lord. Send me. I want to be used by you. I want to see people's lives changed. I want them to go to heaven. I want them to know peace and joy. I want them to know love. I want them to have those things. And maybe it's just one of those moments for us as a church for such a time as this that God would use us to reach out and tell people we know how much God loves them and what God can do in somebody's life. He can transform you. If you look around, and I'm not asking you to, but when I'm standing here looking out here, I see a lot of rugged people that I wouldn't have wanted to encounter on the street before you came to know Jesus. You'd have scared me. If some of you knew who's sitting next to you right now, you'd move. (laughs) But God changes lives, doesn't he? God forgives sin, doesn't he? God delivers, doesn't he? He does. For such a time as this, she's going to take a venture of faith and watch what the Lord is going to do.